John Calvin's interpretation of Colossians 3.13 focuses on the attributes and virtues that signify a person as renewed by Christ. According to Calvin, to be merciful and kind are the defining characteristics of this spiritual transformation. The exhortation to put on these virtues ties back to the previous metaphor of taking off the old man and putting on the new. Calvin elaborates on specific virtues starting with bowels of mercy, a phrase signifying deep, earnest affection and compassion. Next, he discusses kindness, describing it as an attribute that makes us amiable. He links humility to both, stating that genuine kindness and mercy stem from a sense of humility and modesty. In Calvin's view, humility involves relinquishing arrogance and entitlement, thereby allowing kindness to flourish. Also, he mentions gentleness as a broad term that extends beyond just appearance and speech. It's an inward disposition. Calvin states that patience is vital for maintaining gentleness, particularly when dealing with difficult or malicious individuals. Long-suffering for Calvin involves indulging each other's imperfections and forgiving offences. To inspire such forgiveness, Calvin invokes the example of Christ, who has forgiven our offences against him. Moreover, Calvin ties these virtues to the concept of being chosen by God, which he interprets as being set apart for holiness and divine love. He argues that these virtues are the condition and the evidence of that divine selection. In essence, claiming to be holy and beloved by God is futile if one lacks these qualities. The Christian transformation is thus not merely a label, but is evidenced by a cluster of virtues that reflect Christ's own character. Furthermore, Calvin discusses the importance of love as the bond of perfection. He first debates the interpretation of the word epi, suggesting that a more suitable translation could be before all these things, rather than the more common above or over and above. Calvin contends that love is foundational to other virtues like mercy, gentleness and forgiveness. In the absence of love, these virtues cannot exist. Love, therefore, becomes the yardstick for measuring all virtues. Without it, no action, however seemingly virtuous, can be considered righteous. Calvin criticizes the papists for misusing this verse to debate for justification by works, a key theological divide between Protestantism and Catholicism. The papists claim that since love is the bond of perfection, and perfection is righteousness, love must therefore justify us. Calvin rebuts this by saying that the verse is not discussing how one is justified before God, but is instead focused on how to live harmoniously among people. Even if love were considered righteousness, Calvin disputes that no human can achieve perfect love and therefore cannot be justified by it. He argues that individuals are justified not by their observance of the law or by love but by faith, because all have sinned and fall short of the law, necessitating the need for the righteousness of Christ. Calvin's interpretation is rooted in the belief that love is essential for a virtuous life among fellow humans, but it is faith that justifies us before God. In addition, Calvin elaborates on the notion of the peace of God, describing it as the harmony established by God among individuals. Calvin employs the metaphor of a wrestling match to explain that just as the victor reigns over the opponents, the peace of God should reign over all carnal desires and emotions that lead us to conflicts, disagreements, or grudges. He contends that our hearts are the battlegrounds for these internal conflicts between the flesh and the spirit, and the peace of God should emerge as the victor to restrain these corrupt affections. Calvin stresses that this divine peace is the unity to which all are called in Christ. He emphasizes that God has reconciled humanity to himself through Christ, not just for individual salvation, but also to foster harmony among us. According to Calvin, this sense of peace and unity is only possible if we regard ourselves as part of the same body of Christ. This bodily metaphor serves as a reminder that our individual peace with God is interconnected with communal harmony. Further, Calvin interprets the directive to be thankful in this verse as an encouragement for amiability or sweetness in manners rather than just a call for gratitude. 
He believes that a true sense of gratitude toward God naturally leads to a mutual affection among individuals, thereby reinforcing the community's unity. Overall, Calvin's interpretation of this verse centers on the paramount importance of letting the peace of God control our hearts, for it acts as a guiding principle that not only harmonizes our internal conflicts, but also brings about communal unity. Besides, Calvin accentuates the importance of letting the word of Christ dwell deeply within believers, and not just as a superficial acquaintance. He criticizes those who would restrict access to Scripture, debating that Paul's exhortation is directed to everyone, regardless of social or educational status. Calvin insists that the gospel doctrine should be well understood, increasing in its influence over one's life in all wisdom. Additionally, Calvin defines wisdom as the ability to teach and admonish one another. He clarifies that teaching should aim at edification and that it is not an individualistic endeavor, rather it is a communal responsibility. The act of teaching should not just involve sharing doctrine, but also should include admonition, making the teaching an active exhortation to virtuous living. Also, Calvin discusses the role of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in Christian life. For Calvin, all kinds of songs sung by Christians should serve to glorify God and edify the community. He opposes worldly songs that are frivolous or obscene, advocating for songs that have spiritual depth. This is in line with his overall argument that all communication among Christians should be edifying. The phrase in grace refers to a form of wholesome speech that is beneficial to the listeners and contrasts it with useless talk or buffoonery. Moreover, Calvin adds that singing should not be a mere external act, but should emanate from the heart, suggesting an authentic internal disposition should motivate external expressions of faith. Thus, for Calvin, letting the word of Christ dwell within us deeply involves intellectual engagement, communal responsibility, and authentic, heart-driven worship. Last but not least, Calvin affirms the importance of living a Christian life governed by the authority of Christ. He notes that every action and speech should aim for the glory of Christ as the ultimate goal. Calvin disputes that life should be so regulated that both our intentions and our deeds are wholly influenced by Christ's teachings and authority. He implies that this summary principle is sufficient guidance for ethical behavior, negating the need to elaborate on individual precepts of Christian life. Furthermore, Calvin connects this overarching principle to the practice of invocation and blessing God. He suggests that our thanks and blessings should be directed to God the Father through Christ, since it is through Christ that we receive all of God's blessings. In doing so, Calvin encapsulates the essence of Christian living, that all actions and words should not only comply with Christ's authority, but also aim to glorify Him, leading to a life filled with gratitude and devotion. In conclusion, Calvin's interpretation of Colossians 3 is a comprehensive look at the virtues and attributes that define a person as spiritually transformed or renewed by Christ. According to Calvin, virtues like mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience are not just ethical ideals, but also indicators of one's spiritual condition. These virtues serve as evidence that one is chosen by God or set apart for holiness. In addition, Calvin discusses the centrality of love as foundational to all other virtues. He clarifies that the passage does not argue for justification through love, refuting the papists' interpretation. Instead, love is the bond of perfection, essential for harmonious living among humans, whereas justification before God comes through faith. Further, the peace of God, according to Calvin, refers to both internal and communal harmony. This peace should reign over our hearts, subduing internal conflicts and fostering community unity. Besides, Calvin asserts the importance of thankfulness, which goes beyond mere gratitude to include amicable interaction within the community. Additionally, Calvin addresses the importance of deep, thoughtful engagement with Scripture. The Word of Christ should dwell richly within believers, affecting both individual behavior and communal responsibility. 
This extends to the songs Christians sing, which should be spiritual and edifying, not worldly or frivolous. Finally, Calvin highlights that all aspects of life should aim to glorify Christ. This is the overarching principle guiding Christian ethics and practices, negating the need for elaboration on individual precepts. Every action and word should not only comply with Christ's teachings, but aim to glorify Him, leading to a life of gratitude and devotion. Overall, Calvin contends that these virtues and practices are not just ethical choices, but integral to the Christian transformation and testimony of being renewed in Christ.